Good evening. I am uh, Maurizio Muraca. I am professor of internal medicine at the University of Padua. Welcome to the second international webinar course organized by Bromatec and by the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility. Uh, first, some information regarding the language and translation. Voila, here it is. I'm not so good with the Spanish and I hope that all Spanish speaking followers can, can read this uh, slide better than I could do. If you have to follow your webinar in English, you don't have to do anything. In case uh, you want to follow the Italian or uh, uh, Spanish translation, you have to click on the interpretation icon, as you can see from the yellow arrow, and choose your language. And then uh, you can mute the original audio to mute the background English audio. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, at this time, I like also to thank Professor Giovanni Barbara from the University of Bologna, who is the scientific manager of this course. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kazim Aziz. Dr. Aziz is professor of neurogastroenterology at the Queen Mary University of London. He is president of the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility and he is member of the Educational Committee of the European Federation of Gastroenterology. The title of his presentation is Stressed Gut, Stressed Brain and Visceral Pain in Irritable Bowel Syndrome. Please, Professor Aziz. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind um, introduction. And uh, also thank you to um, colleagues and other organizers who uh, have invited me for this lecture. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the role of uh, stress um, and uh, how it affects the brain gut axis and leads to the pathophysiology of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and I would just like to um, just start with the basic um, IBS diagnostic criteria just to remind everyone that IBS is a condition which is predominantly associated with recurrent abdominal pain. This is a absolute must criteria for us to be able to diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. And it has to be a chronic pain which lasts for at least three months, present for at least three months and occurs at least one day a week. And of course it is related to problems of defecation, which could be change in frequency of stool or change in form. It's a chronic um, uh, recurrent pain that we are dealing with. And this pain in IBS is the predominant, being the predominant symptom is also the most difficult one uh, to treat. This is the symptom that keeps bringing the patients back to our clinics and causes a considerable amount of morbidity uh, in our patients. And of course, mechanisms are in some way speculative, but are also recognized to be multifactorial and can be difficult to pin down in any one patient. So we will try and describe some of these uh, mechanisms, but perhaps it is important to just think a little bit in terms of how these patients present to us. There is a proportion, perhaps a third of patients, who give a previous history of gut inflammation or injury, either in the form of a previous infection like a gastroenteritis, recent surgery, or patients with inflammatory bowel disease. We know a proportion of them go on to experience irritable bowel syndrome type of patients, predominantly with uh, ongoing chronic abdominal pain. There is also a high prevalence of psychological disorders such as anxiety, depression, somatization, panic disorders in uh, this group 
of patients. And quite often, there is an overlap between these two problems. So those who develop infections, if they have psychological problems, they are more likely to develop irritable bowel syndrome. And similarly, patients with IBD, etc., who have more psychological issues are more likely to develop pain, even though inflammation has largely healed. And if we just review what is known about the mechanisms of chronic pain in general, which includes chronic visceral pain, we see that there are pathways from the periphery, for instance, from visceral, with regard to visceral pain, there are afferent pathways that carry information through the spinal dorsal horn neurons up to the brain stem, and then second order neurons take the information to the pain areas of the brain, such as the uh, limbic cortex, which includes the amygdala, but also the sensory cortex for sensory discrimination. There are also descending pathways that come down from the brain to the periphery, and these predominantly are descending pain inhibitory pathways. They reduce the intensity of pain. So at any one time, the amount of pain that you experience is a balance between the intensity of uh, signals going up uh, the afferent pathways to the brain and the descending inhibition that is coming down from the brain to the periphery. This information is then processed. And if there is an overlap with stress, be it psychological stress, physiological stress, then the, the stress physiological response systems of which the most important and the first one on the scene is often the HPA axis. The HPA axis gets activated, causes release of cortisol. And this activation often has an effect on the peripheral uh, structures, uh, in, in our case, the gastrointestinal tract through activation of various uh, receptors, which then can also sensitize that. And we will go into the details of this uh, interaction in the next uh, few slides. Now, when there is peripheral injury, inflammation or uh, infection, Etc. then you can get sensitization of these afferent pathways. This is described as peripheral sensitization. Once the peripheral sensitization sets in, it can lead to sensitization at the level of the central nervous system, both at the level of the spinal dorsal horn neurons and at the level of the brain. And this state is, as I described, activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis leading to visceral hypersensitivity and altered pain thresholds. We will explore all these mechanisms in more detail as uh, we go through the presentation. Now, stress uh, induces brain gut dysfunction in irritable bowel syndrome, be it physiological or psychological stress, as I just suggested before, HPA axis, but also the autonomic nervous system is another one of the stress response systems. These are the two immediately activated systems and they try and restore homeostasis um, in, in an acute situation. However, if the stress becomes chronic and homeostasis cannot be restored, then the second layer comes in, which is dysfunction in the immune system. And when there is dysfunction of the immune system, you start to then get activation of uh, mast cells, microglia, cytokines, and changes in the gut microbiota. These chronic changes then lead to a change in the gut phenotype so that there is uh, altered or neuromus uh, uh, dysfunction of the neuromuscular apparatus in the gut, barrier function gets affected, and the afferent nerves become more sensitive. And there is a feedback effect of the change in gut phenotype. So when all of these problems are occurring, there is increase in the amount of physiological and uh, psychological stress, and the whole cycle keeps on getting perpetuated. But of course, how we respond to the, respond to the stress depends on some external factors like your personality, the type of person you are. And it's, for instance, if you're a more anxious, nervous, neurotic personality, these problems may affect you more. And of course, there is also your genetic predisposition to stress, which we will come to again later on in the presentation. 
The important thing also to remember is that these stress response systems are very well integrated. They interact with one another. There is a lot of crosstalk. And there are, there are reasons for this uh, crosstalk as shown in this very elegant um, 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 figure, which just shows that when there is stress, there is activation, for instance, of the HPA axis with the end result that glucocorticoids are released and they actually have an effect on the immune system. The immune system may release cytokines, which in turn have an effect on the autonomic nerve, such as the vagus nerve. And these then have an effect on the central nervous system. You may have cytokines going through the bloodstream up into the brain as well. And that will perpetuate the stress that is occurring at a, at a, at a more central level. And you get more activation of these stress response systems. Now, if you look closely at the interaction between the autonomic nervous system and the immune cells, we actually see that the parasympathetic, sympathetic nerves, they're releasing a number of neurotransmitters. And there are other neurotransmitters released such as CGRP, VIPs, substance P, et cetera. And all of these have receptors on these immune cells, on the T cells, on the macrophages, on the B cells, on the dendritic cells. And therefore there is a direct crosstalk communication going on between these neurotransmitters and the immune cells, which then leads to the release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these pro-inflammatory cytokines then have an effect on the uh, parasympathetic um, uh, and sympathetic nerves directly as well, uh, as well as indirectly. Um, through the circulation, um, and uh, they, they pass into the, uh, through the blood-brain barrier into the brain as well. Uh, um, looking at the HP axis and the role in chronic stress and how that perpetuates the chronic um, hypersensitivity, uh, we know that when there is stress, uh, hypothalamus uh, thalamus gets activated, there's release of uh, CRH, from the hypothalamus, which has an effect on the pituitary gland, which then releases ACTH, which has an effect on the adrenal cortex, and that releases cortisol in humans and corticosterone in animals. Now, this cortisol then has a negative, um, uh, this activates the glucocorticoid receptors, but it has an inhibitory feedback loop, both to the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, to reduce the activation of the HPA axis. But this, these cortisol and um, uh, uh, corticosterone can have a positive feedback effect on the amygdala in such a way that when there is chronic stress, your CRH gets activated chronically and the glucocorticoid receptor um, becomes inhibited. This therefore means that you have more CRH, which then activates the HPA axis and chronically keeps it active. There are also other changes going on, which is more in the uh, epigenetic changes at the level of the glucocorticoid receptor and the CRH promoter region. If there is excessive methylation and re reduced acetylation, you can actually again get a reduction in the glucocorticoid receptor and an increase in the CRH receptor, which keeps the HPA axis active chronically. Now, stress can be induced in many different ways in experimental animals. And one of the most popular common one uh, model that is used is the maternal separation model, which very nicely describes the alterations in the brain gut axis. So you remove the pups from the mother, and then when these pups grow up, they show all the signs of altered brain gut axis that you see in patients with irritable bowel syndrome as well. So there's visceral hypersensitivity, altered gut microbiota, altered immune response, they have anxiety, they have depression, they have changes in intestinal barrier permeability, they have heightened stress responses, they have changes in neurochemistry, um, et cetera. So all of these factors that we see and, and we know that exist in irritable bowel syndrome can be activated through stress. And of course, we know that childhood adversity is a major risk factor for irritable bowel syndrome uh, as well. But let's look at the altered gut microbiota in a bit more detail uh, and its role in relationship to stress and uh, gastrointestinal function in irritable bowel syndrome. There are many factors that influence uh, gut um, uh, uh, microbiota. 
And these factors include diet, uh, which we'll hear from Professor Whelan in a bit more detail, but our topic is more stress. And of course, ingestion of probiotics and antibiotics, all of those external factors will then lead to changes in gut microbiota, which in, turn, which in turn will have an effect on the brain, and this can alter our behavior. The, re, the way that this interaction between the gut microbiota and the brain occurs is through multiple routes of communication. Altered gut microbiota may increase the, uh, increase the inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which as we've seen can have a direct effect or effect via the uh, autonomic nervous system uh, on the brain, they may actually change the uh, function of the enteroendocrine cells, leading to changes in gut hormone profiles, or enterochromaffin cells can then lead to changes in neurotransmitters that are released, such as 5-HT, et cetera. There are lots of metabolic products and short-chain fatty acids, et cetera, that are released, which can also have a direct effect uh, on the brain. So all of these, these uh, changes that are occurring in the gut microbiota are feeding into, through multiple pathways, to this brain changes and alteration of the brain, brain gut axis. And of course, when there are external stresses and physiological stresses, then activation, for instance, of the HPA axis can change gastrointestinal sensitivity, motor function, and have an effect on gut microbiota as well. So in effect, there is this reciprocal relationship between the microbiota gut and the gut-brain axis through this afferent or upstream influence on your transmitters, which can affect your level of stress, anxiety, mood, behavior, and then downstream effects, which can affect your motility, secretion, nutrient delivery, microbial balance, um, et cetera. And therefore, for normal function, of, of uh, the gut in health, we need a good balance between these two arms, which is often, as we know, disrupted in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. Now, there's some very elegant work that has uh, been done in germ-free mice um, to see whether they the, the, um, the germ-free animals, uh, whether they have changes in the gut sensitivity. And indeed, if you look at the vasomotor response uh, on the abdominal muscles, in response to colorectal distension, you, what you see is that the germ-free mice are more created, uh, demonstrate a heightened vasomotor response in comparison to the control animals. And if you look at their pain thresholds, these germ-free mice have lower pain thresholds in comparison to the control animals. However, if you recolonize these germ-free um, uh, rodents uh, with, uh, with gut microbiota, what you see is normalization of the vasomotor response that these now are producing a less robust rate of motor response. And the, there is a reversal of this increased sensitivity and the pain thresholds increase back to the levels that you see in the control animals, suggesting that altered gut microbiota in the germ-free mice is um, likely to contribute to the visceral hypersensitivity. There are also other changes that are seen in uh, these germ-free uh, mice. For instance, changes in the toll-like receptors, which as you know, are uh, receptors in the sub-epithelial layers, which sense micro microbial products and activate the innate immune response. And as you will see, the vast majority of the toll-like uh, receptors are increased in germ-free mice. And similarly, the cytokine levels, mRNA, levels of cytokines of all the pro-inflammatory cytokines levels are mostly increased in the germ-free mice. And when they are recolonized, there is a normalization of both the toll-like receptors and normalization of the most of these cytokines as well. So suggesting that the germ-free mice with the altered environment uh, that their gut has um, because of the germ-free environment, there are changes that occur in the um, sort of expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as the innate uh, immune uh, response activated by the toll-like um, receptors. Furthermore, glial activation uh, at the level of the spinal cord, and glia are very important in the uh, development of uh, chronic pain, has been demonstrated in many different models of chronic pain. 
Um, so glial markers are also increased in germ-free mice at the level of the spinal cord, and they normalize when the gut is recolonized and cytokine protein levels, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine protein levels uh, also increase, and these normalize uh, as well after recolonization. And very interestingly, in the same study, these authors demonstrated that there was a reduction in the volume of the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a very important part of the limbic cortex and is responsible for processing the affective and cognitive components of pain. There is a reduction in volume. Overall volume of the cortex remains unchanged. And there is increase in volume of the periaqueductal gray matter, which is a part of the midbrain from which descending inhibitory uh, pathways uh, uh, pass through and originate. And therefore there is an increase in volume there. So at this stage, one can just say that there are altered volumes uh, in, within the uh, certain pain specific areas that are correlated uh, with the change in environment in the gut in, in the germ-free mice. And certainly there are human studies as well which show altered brain volume in chronic pain, both neuropathic chronic pain, and there are one or two studies which show altered volumes in patients with irritable bowel syndrome um, as well. So if you look at the gut microbiota and visceral pain, there are various studies which show that exposure to stresses or antibiotic treatment in early life can have an enduring effect on visceral pain in animal models, in particularly rodent models. And these can be accompanied by change in microbial composition. Uh, pro and, and interestingly, probiotics can ameliorate visceral pain and used by either stress or antibiotic um, administration. In human studies, it is, a, it is a, uh, it's demonstrated that the composition of gut microbiota is altered in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. There are lots of studies which, which talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as well. And patients suffering with abdominal pain can benefit from probiotic um, treatment um, as well. And the meta-analyses that have been done generally in, in IBS patients generally tend to show a trend towards um, improvement um, based on the use of probiotics. Next, we come to the brain-gut immune axis, and I wanted to go through this in a little bit more detail. There is a reciprocal communication between the immune system through cytokines and neuropeptides and vice versa from the brain as well. There are various neuropeptides, hormones, and neurotransmitters that are having an effect on the immune system. And this reciprocal interaction is active and relevant in irritable bowel syndrome. For instance, we see in patients who've had a gastroenteritis, if you take mucosal biopsies from their rectum and examine them in the acute stage, almost all the patients who've had an infection will show in an inflammatory response. But if you actually study these same patients three months later, only the ones who continue to have IBS-like symptoms, they show the inflammatory response in the mucosal biopsies, whereas those in whom the symptoms settle down after the acute infections are improved and controls obviously do not show this increase in inflammatory response. So there is some evidence there that there is ongoing chronic inflammatory response in patients with post-infective irritable bowel syndrome. And in these very elegant studies by Hughes um, et al., they demonstrated that even in constipation-predominant IBS, there are some pro-inflammatory cytokines that are increased in the peripheral blood. But in Diarrhea predominant, particularly post-infective diarrhea predominant IBS patients, there is a significant increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. And if we actually then look at one of these, uh, which is the TNF alpha, what we actually see there is that there is a correlation between the levels of TNF alpha and the pain intensity measured on the visual analog scale. There is a positive correlation between the two. So the higher the levels of TNF-alpha, the greater the pain intensity that these patients experience. And if you actually then take supernatants from mucosal uh, biopsies in healthy controls and also in um, uh, post-infective irritable bowel syndrome patients and then apply it on various afferents in the gut uh, in, in mouse uh, models. So you apply them to the serosal afferents, 
mucosal afferents, muscular afferents, muscular mucosal afferents, the supernatants from healthy subjects, they actually do not show a increase in activity before and after application of the supernatants in any of these types, different types of afferents that are present in the gastrointestinal tract. However, when you take supernatants from IBS patients so, and apply them to these uh, uh, different uh, nerves, uh, uh, you see an increase in activity um, within the serosal, mucosal, muscular, mucosal um, component of these muscular mucosal and so on. So I'm suggesting that there are some inflammatory mediators that sensitize afferents uh, in the um, in the afferent nerves um, in in this model uh, of um, studying mouse uh, afferent uh, response. Now, we also know that mast cells are also known to be increased in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. Various studies have shown that, and this is the classical study uh, by Professor Barbara and his group, which showed increase in mast cells in patients with um, irritable bowel syndrome. And these mast cells were very close to the uh, afferent nerves. And if you actually take IBS patients and compare them to healthy controls, then the percentage of mast cells that were closer to the nerves is much higher in IBS patients compared to controls. And if you actually take supernatants where you use some of these mast cell mediators and apply them to afferent nerves in a rodent model, you actually again see that in the uh, IBS patients, there is marked increase in afferent discharge from these afferent nerves compared to uh, just using saline or supernatants from healthy, um, healthy subjects. Now, mast cells are also very relevant to stress um, and stress-related increase in intestinal um, permeability because stress is a major activator of these mast cells. And when these mast cells degranulate, they release a number of uh, uh, mediators, which include histamine and proteases, et cetera, which can cause low-grade inflammation in the subepithelial layers and the epithelial layers of the gastrointestinal tract, which can then cause an increase in permeability. And the luminal contents can then start to sensitize the afferent nerves in the um, epithelial and subepithelial layers. This hypersensitivity through a reflex arc then can have an effect on the muscle layer and cause dysmotility and so on. So the role of mast cells in, within this uh, HP, uh, within these brain gut axis and particularly in the stress response is, is very important um, as well. Now, I'm going to now touch on the role of genetic and epigenetic factors in irritable bowel syndrome, and we will see how they correlate through the, with, the, uh, with this whole stress uh, response uh, systems um, uh, as well. Now, this is a very nice uh, summary slide, um, which shows that there are various studies which have shown genetic changes that are associated with irritable bowel syndrome. Polymorphisms have been identified in various genes which lead to uh, change in function in those um, um, sort of uh, uh, receptors uh, related to neurotransmission, such as the tryptophan hydroxylase, CERT, and various and adrenergic alpha receptors, uh, um, cannabinoid receptors. There are changes in barrier function and immune inflammatory mediators through the effect on toll-like receptors, interleukins, et cetera, and also on iron channel and bile acids. And the endophenotype that is produced could be IBS diarrhea, IBS constipation, but we also see that the endophenotype also includes pain and bloating, but abdominal pain, particularly emotional abnormalities, changes in barrier function, changes in innate immune response, et cetera. So there seems to be that there are predisposing genetic factors that when the right environmental hit comes along, may become very relevant in the development of um, problems that we see in our patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And as I mentioned before, there are also epigenetic changes, including DNA methylation and histone modification, et cetera, that have been associated with uh, irritable bowel, bowel syndrome. Again, various genes have been 
identified affecting different types of receptors like the glucocorticoid receptors and CRF receptors and cannabinoid receptors and TRPV1 receptors and BDNF receptors. And interestingly, the phenotype that is produced, visceral hypersensitivity appears to be a very common subtype, uh, a type of um, response that we see um, in these studies that have been done showing that where there are uh, changes in these, uh, where are these, there, there are these epigenetic changes. Um, there are also studies looking at the micro RNAs uh, in irritable bowel syndrome. And again, there are various receptors uh, related to 5-HT, glutamate receptors, 5-HT comes in again, and the nucleidin uh, uh, genes, et cetera, related to gut uh, um, permeability, cannabinoid receptors, CERT, etc. And the endophenotype again can include quite a lot of visceral pain, activation of pain and inflammatory pathways, sense, increase in sensitivity, permeability, pain and nociception, etc. Now, in the final part of my talk, I'm just going to touch upon how do we bring all of this information together and try and understand this interaction between particularly two of the immediate stress response system, the autonomic nervous system and the HPA axis with psychological factors and genetic factors. So as we see stress, for example, caused by pain can activate the HPA axis and the autonomic nervous system almost immediately. And the question therefore is whether this interaction can help us to identify any endophenotypes. And if we throw within that the uh, possibility of genetic factors, and individual factors such as differences in personality, et cetera, how do these stress response systems behave in, um, in humans? Um, we know that the autonomic nervous system and psychological factors interact. We know that the parasympathetic nervous system is antinociceptive, whereas the sympathetic nervous system is pronociceptive. And autonomic measures such as low vagal tone, cardiac vagal tone, and high sympathetic tone have been linked with, linked with personality traits such as neuroticism. And personality also is known to affect the pain experience. For instance, neurotic individuals, they have heightened pain perception and various studies have shown that. Now, there is a theory presented by Professor Stephen Porges from the USA called the polyvagal theory, which describes a phylogenetic organization of the brainstem mediated vagal response to stress. And this is a very interesting theory, which suggests that whenever there is stress in the environment, there is a arousal which can progressively increase. If there is mild stress, then you get activation of the ventral vagus, which leads to social engagement. So if there is a stressor in your environment, you look around, see what's causing the stress and see if by social engagement, by giving a smile, or saying hello to someone, whether you can um, cause some reduction in the cause of stress and whether you can get away with it through the social engagement. However, if that doesn't, uh, that doesn't work and the stress keeps on increasing, the arousal keeps on increasing, you will activate your sympathetic nervous system now and get ready for fight or flight. You see so your vagus nerve is now getting deactivated and the sympathetic nervous system is now getting activated. Now, if even this does not work, you're not able to run away, you're not able to fight and you're losing in a bad way and the stress and the danger has increased to a level which has become critical and you just cannot escape that, then you activate the dorsal vagal complex again and you create a shutdown response where the heart rate will suddenly drop, allowing you to shut down, demonstrate hopelessness, preparation for death or feign death at least. So as you know, in acute stressful situations, some soldiers will, for instance, in the war, feign death, et cetera, when they know that the situation has become hopeless. So, so the vagus nerve, the autonomic nervous system, allows the development of these different engagement strategies to cope with, cope with stress. So on this uh, theory, we uh, tested the hypothesis that personality traits will influence the autonomic nervous system and the HPA axis responses to visceral pain because we know that the stress response system vary in individuals and vary according to the personality. 
And these factors will contribute to the identification of distinct pain clusters in healthy subjects based on personality traits, their autonomic response to pain, such as the cardiac vagal tone response to pain, HPA response to pain by measuring cortisol, polymorphisms of the serotonin transporter, and then some brain imaging studies to look at the central nervous system activation in response to these um, stresses. Now, if you look at the um, uh, interaction between baseline autonomic measures and personality and the HPA axis tone, what we found was that neuroticism, higher neuroticism was associated with lower baseline parasympathetic tone, i.e. the cardiac vagal tone was lower in those individuals who had high neuroticism. So, and it was interesting that in, pace, in subjects who had high neuroticism, their baseline um, scores of cortisols were high. So these people who are neurotic appear to have predominantly low vagal tone, but high baseline cortisol levels. So they're more sort of stress prone, so to speak. Then using cluster analyses, where we looked at predefined input parameters, such as neuroticism, extroversion, baseline, and seek cardiac vagal tone and change in cardiac vagal to, tone to visceral and somatic pain. Um, we performed this two-step cluster analysis, which identified two clusters, where cluster A was represented by 61% of the subjects and cluster B by almost 40% of the, of the subjects. Now I'm just going to describe these two clusters. So cl cluster A was the extrovert cluster. At baseline, they had low anxiety, they demonstrated the LL genotype of the serotonin receptor, they had low sympathetic tone, high parasympathetic tone, and lower cortisol levels. When they were in pain, and pain was induced experimentally either by balloon distension or uh, nail bed pressure, and this was maximum tolerated pain that uh, the subjects could tolerate. In pain, these subjects, the extroverts, or cluster A tolerated more pain, they habituated more, they had more sympathetic activation, they had sympathetic, parasympathetic withdrawal, and they preferentially activated the right frontal cortex, insula, and the left thalamus. So in effect, when they are in extreme sort of stress, they mount the fight and flight response. The neurotic cluster had high anxiety at baseline. They demonstrated the S allele of the serotonin transporter region, which has been associated with anxiety and neuroticism. They had high baseline sympathetic tone and low parasympathetic tone and elevated cortisol at baseline. And in pain, they had reduced pain intensity, i.e. they were more pain sensitive. They habituated less. They created a parasympathetic withdrawal and parasympathetic, uh, sorry, sympathetic uh, withdrawal and parasympathetic um, activation. And in effect, so this is in a stressful panic-like situation they basically mount the freeze response. They just freeze. You see the headlights and you freeze. And, and therefore, uh, and, and these were tested again uh, at one year and these traits were stable over that one year period. And interestingly, this pain cluster B, the neurotic pain cluster was more common in patients with functional chest pain compared to um, healthy, um, healthy controls. And there are studies which show in meta-analysis done in IBS, that the low, uh, uh, there, there is a lower high frequency um, uh, tone uh, within the spectral analysis of ECG in patients with IBS, which represents, the, which suggests the fact that their vagal tone is lower in comparison to uh, controls uh, at, uh, um, at baseline when they're not stimulated with any pain, they seem to have a lower uh, vagal tone. And if you have co perform cognitive behavioral therapy, you can normalize the vagal tone and normalize this uh, low frequency, high frequency ratio in these, um, in these patients. Uh, yeah. So in conclusion, there are a number of factors that lead to the pathophysiology of um, irritable bowel syndrome. There are genetic and epigenetic factors which may lead to changes in gene expression uh, for uh, various functions, uh, including uh, visceral pain and immunity and barrier function, but there are also environmental factors and other peripheral gut factors like infection or host microbial factors, which feed into these genetic and epigenetic factors. 
but they also can have a direct effect on the gastrointestinal tract and lead to changes in sensation, motor function, immune function, transit secretion, etc., which in the chronic state perpetuates these uh, ongoing problems and leads to these chronic IBS um, symptoms. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for, for your attention. And, uh, over to the over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Aziz, for your inspiring presentation. You, you mentioned the, the role of microbiota in chronic visceral pain. Uh, may I ask you, how would you translate this in clinical practice? I mean, can you translate this uh, concept in the management of patients with the chronic visceral pain? Yes. So we know, uh, for instance, that one of the main symptoms in patients who truly do have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and numerous studies have um, shown that there is a higher incidence of um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in, um, in IBS patients, then pain does improve. So one of the one of the main symptoms that will improve in these patients after treatment with rifaximine, for instance, is improvement in pain. And colicky pain is a very common feature in, in these subjects. So for all the reasons that I've described in my presentation of how these gut microbiota affect the brain-gut axis, normalization of the microbiota leads to a reduction in pain. And of course, probiotics, uh, various studies have shown efficacy, and uh, some studies haven't. And if you actually look at the meta-analysis, overall, it favors a improvement uh, in symptoms with, uh, with probiotics, but still the jury is out exactly which probiotic to use, for how long to use, et cetera. Um, and um, you know, there is a lot more, I think, work that needs, um, needs to be done. But altered gut microbiota um, and the effect on visceral pain is something that we do recognize, but more research is needed to know exactly how to manage it, how to treat it, and the role of probiotics needs to be explored a little bit further, although the current evidence suggests that there is um, an effect. Thank you again, Professor Aziz. My pleasure. Thank you. It is uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, our second speaker, Dr. Kevin Whelan. Dr. Whelan is a professor of dietetics and director of the Department of Nutritional Sciences at King's College of London. The title of his presentation is Diet, Microbiota and Abdominal Bloating in Irritable Bowel Syndrome. Please, uh, Professor Whelan. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I do hope um, you can all see my slides. Please do um, let me know if not. Um, it's a great pleasure to be presenting here to you this evening um, uh, in, under the current circumstances um, of the pandemic that we're all facing. This is one of the first um, virtual online presentations I've done. So um, thank you very much to the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility for inviting me and to Bromatech, of course, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'd like to also thank the translators for enabling this lecture to be delivered to many people speaking many different languages all over the world. So thank you very much. I will try to keep my, my, my pace uh, to a reasonable level. Um, and thank you to Professor Aziz for a really excellent presentation. And I think will be a really great um, a help for me because he's really helped discuss some of the mechanisms through which the microbiota can impact in irritable bowel syndrome. So my lecture is diet, the microbiota and abdominal bloating in irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and I'd just like to um, ask you to think about the um, about how wide a problem this is. 
The latest data on the prevalence of irritable bowel syndrome published in January in gastroenterology um, shows a, a slight reduction in the um, reported prevalence due to the revised definition of irritable bowel syndrome. I've taken here the data for European countries and um, the data demonstrates that uh, the prevalence of irritable bowel syndrome ranges from 3.3% um, to 5% in Europe. Um, and that may sound like a much smaller figure than we've been quoting recently, but I'd like you to think about the reality of how many people that impacts. That means that 24 to 37 million people um, living in Europe have irritable bowel syndrome. And that has a profound, significant impact on them as individuals, on their families, and the healthcare system um, who must try to help them live with these symptoms. And Professor Aziz has really elegantly summarized the um, pathophysiology of irritable bowel syndrome. I'm really only um, putting this image here just to remind us that it is complex and many of the factors are interrelated. Um, and I will only this evening be speaking about the interaction between diet and the gut microbiota, but I don't want to um, imply that these are the only two mechanisms um, of effect. It is, it is complex and often these uh, factors affect each other. But what I will be talking about this evening is the interaction between diet and the gut microbiota and IBS. Um, I unfortunately don't have time to really detail uh, about how diet impacts the gut microbiota in general, um, because there are many, many cross-sectional studies, many randomized controlled trials showing that different diets, different foods and different supplements can impact the gut microbiota. There are many studies um, that also demonstrate that the gut microbiota may themselves be then associated with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and I will take a lot of time to um, review some of these studies. And of course, the mechanisms through which they act um, have been described by Professor Aziz. And then finally, I will review how diet can be used to manage irritable bowel syndrome and that I will demonstrate that there are mechanisms that are mediated dependently um, of the microbiota and independently of the microbiota. And first, I'm going to start by reviewing how, how the gut microbiota is associated with IBS. Now, as Professor Aziz mentioned, there are uh, many, many studies demonstrating this. Um, the first evidence comes from evidence of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Um, we often hear about the Walkerton studies when, um, when cattle manure entered into the water supply and caused an entire town to um, develop um, enteritis. But there are actually now many studies um, demonstrating the increased risk of um, irritable bowel syndrome following infectious enteritis. Here is a meta-analysis of observational studies. There are now 45 different studies um, demonstrating an, a relationship to infectious enteritis. And in fact, 30 of those are case control studies, which compare people who did develop enteritis um, compared with people who didn't develop infectious enteritis and comparing their prevalence of IBS. So within 12 months of somebody developing infectious enteritis, the prevalence of IBS in, the, in those people will be 10%, and that's 4.2 fold higher um, than in healthy controls who didn't develop infectious enteritis. If you wait a little bit longer, so if you wait for over 12 months after people develop infectious enteritis, um, they will have a 2.3 fold higher odds of developing irritable bowel syndrome. Now your risk of developing in, in irritable bowel syndrome after an infectious enteritis um, will depend on what you're infected with. And so a bacterial infection is related to, with a 2.2 fold greater risk of um, development of IBS and a protozoa or a parasitic infection is associated with a 3.2 fold increase in risk of developing IBS. Um, but actually, interestingly, viral infections have not been associated with a significant increase um, of infectious, uh, of having developing irritable bowel syndrome in the future. 
There are also numerous case control studies uh, demonstrating differences in the microbiota between people with IBS and people without. Here's, I think, probably the most detailed analysis of that, which has done metagenomic sequencing of um, 1,025 healthy controls and 412 people with irritable bowel syndrome. And it, what it does is produce these really amazing figures that look a little bit like stingrays. Um, and what they're demonstrating is the Shannon index, which is a measure of the diversity of the microbiome. We think that the microbiome should be diverse. The more diverse the microbiome is, then um, we believe that's associated with a greater genetic potential to be able to, um, to, to, be able to metabolize different components of the gut. Um, and so um, we know that people with IBS have a lower um, uh, alpha diversity. So they have a lower total number of different bacteria in the gut. But then when we also look at the different phyla in the gut, um, these were shown to be different. And so people with IBS have been shown to have more firmicutes, less bacteroidetes, um, and less actinobac actinobacteria than healthy controls. Then when we look at the species level, um, compared with healthy controls, people with IBS differed with the abundance of 37 different species. So they had higher levels of some species and lower levels of other species. So if you want more information on that, take a look at that paper. It's a really great example of it. Another paper um, that's also examined through case control study, the differences in microbiota between um, people with IBS and healthy controls, is this paper here published in 2017 in Gastroenterology. Um, I will only present the initial ecological analysis, which compares the two groups. Um, and effectively through 16S um, sequencing, what they have shown is people with more severe IBS have lower microbial richness, so that's again lower diversity of their microbiome. They exhale less um, methane, um, so they have less methane production in their gut, and they have more people with a bacteroides type enterotype. So two studies demonstrating differences in the microbiome between people with IBS and people without. So it's not just that people with IBS have a different microbiome, it's also that they respond differently to the products of fermentation in the microbiome. So this work here is done by the University of Nottingham through Robin Spiller's group. Um, and what they've analyzed um, using magnetic resonance imaging, so MRI, is that they have measured the amount of colonic gas produced by people when they um, consume glucose, which really shouldn't produce much um, colonic gas because it's rapidly absorbed in the small intestine. And they compared that between healthy volunteers and, and, and also with patients with IBS. What you can see is that um, those figures are almost identical. So that um, when people uh, are um, people with healthy people and people with um, IBS consume fructose, they get a very small increase in their colonic gas production. And when they um, have a complex uh, uh, fermentable carbohydrate, such as inulin, they, um, they both um, develop um, colonic gas later on. So in the respect of how much gas they produce, they're producing the same amount of gas in response to a stimulus. But what's really interesting is then if you measure the symptoms that they experience. So at the top, you can see the symptoms of the healthy volunteers. You can see at baseline, they have very low symptoms, as you would expect, because they don't have IBS. And when they have this increase of gas, when they consume insulin, and inulin, sorry, they do not have any symptoms at all. But then look at the bottom figure. What you can see is that people with IBS, um, when, they when they consume inulin, what you can see is firstly, they have a higher baseline symptoms because they have IBS, but then when they start to um, develop gas in their colon, they start to um, um, experience symptoms. And this is the visceral sensitivity that Professor Aziz mentioned earlier. So what we believe is not only that these are the microbiota different, but that it's not the result of a different level of gas fermentation being produced, but a different sensitivity to the gas being produced. And then finally, and also something that Professor Aziz has spoken of, is that we know that it's an activated mucosal immune system in the gut of some people with irritable bowel syndrome. Many different studies, one here showing increased in mast cells and intraepithelial lymphocytes, 
Um, and then another study here comparing 49 people with IBSD and 30 healthy controls showing higher levels of lymphocytes and, and higher levels of IgG positive cells in the gut. So overall, um, I think I've shown um, together with Professor Aziz that the gut microbiota is associated with IBS. I've demonstrated that there's an, we know that because there's an increased risk of IBS following gastroenteritis. There are an altered microbiota in IBS. There's an increased sensitivity to gut fermentation in IBS and there's increased stimulation of the gut immune system in IBS. So now having demonstrated the relationship between the gut microbiota and IBS, um, I'm now going to move on to the um, uh, relationship between diet um, and the gut microbiota and IBS. And what we have is an interesting observation of how research into diet has changed really quite dramatically over uh, the last 40 or 50 years. Um, what we can see here, um, myself and my colleague, Dr. Irini Damidi, have um, reviewed all of the studies of dietary interventions in IBS. And what you can see is if you date back to the 1970s, um, uh, this is a plot of the year of publication versus the um, size of the um, study um, that has been conducted. And what you can see in the 70s and 80s, there was a great deal of research on fibre in irritable bowel syndrome. And then in the 80s and 90s and um, early noughties, that was overtaken by research onto probiotics in irritable bowel syndrome. And with time, you can see those studies on probiotics getting bigger in their sample size. And then um, in the in the teenies, in the you know, in the post 2010s, you can see the emergence of research on the low FODMAP diet in irritable bowel syndrome. And you can see that comparatively they've been rather small so far in compared to studies of probiotics. I don't have time today to talk about fiber in particular in, in irritable bowel syndrome. And so what I will focus on uh, today is mostly probiotics, prebiotics, and the low FODMAP diet. So we'll start with talking about probiotics. These are defined as live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts, confirm, confer a health benefit to the host. And so these are live bacteria that people can take in fermented milks or in yogurts or in sachets or in capsules or in powders and things like that. I'm often asked whether probiotics actually do anything to the gut microbiome. Well, there is a systematic review that has addressed exactly this question. There are seven different randomized controlled trials that have investigated whether um, the microbiota uh, are altered by, um, by probiotic consumption. And six of those showed absolutely no effect of a probiotic on the global composition of the gut microbiome. So they had no impact on alpha diversity, on beta diversity, or, in, or caused any major changes in phyla. What probiotics do do is that they increase the numbers of the strains or species that they contain. So if a, if a probiotic contains lactobacillus, then you will see an increase in lactobacillus in the gut. If a probiotic contains bifidobacteria, you will see an increase in bifidobacteria in the gut. Um, but you won't see any large changes in the global composition, such as the total number of bacteria or the different um, phyla in the gut. So I know there'll be lots of interest in whether probiotics do actually work in, in IBS. This is the, um, the most robust um, meta-analysis that's been performed so far. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that I've put a, a little Twitter handle um, and the hashtag for this meeting and my, my own um, Twitter handle there. And that's because what I've done is um, rather than needing to, to write down that reference, if you are on social media, you can just go along to um, that. You can um, uh, look at my um, Twitter feed and um, I've posted a link to this paper so that you can just click on the link and download the paper automatically yourself rather than needing to uh, write down the reference. So wherever you see that logo, um, that means you can just pop over and download the paper directly. 
um, from my from my Twitter feed. Um, so what you will see here is that there are 52 different randomized controlled trials of probiotics in the management of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and what the what um, Professor Ford did when um, meta-analyzing them is to analyze them um, based upon the genus or, 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 or um, of, of those studies that were available. And what you can see is that combination probiotics, so multi-strain, multi-species probiotics, where there were far more of those than any other different type of bacteria. And you can see that there was a reduction in the persistence of symptoms. So what that means is for the combination probiotics, the relative risk was 0.79. So that means a 21% lower risk of having symptoms after taking a pro this a combination multi-strain probiotic. For lactobacilli, you can see that wasn't quite statistically significant, or where you can see that for some strains on the forest plot, that, that was significant. For bifidobacteria, for the three trials included that were bifidobacteria strains, there was almost a significant effect in uh, reducing the risk of persistent symptoms. And there were also studies for Saccharomyces probiotics, um, Escherichia probiotics, and Streptococcus probiotics. So if you want to read that paper, um, go, and, uh, go and click on the link and, um, and, and download it and read a little bit more about it. Um, one problem I think it's really, really crucial um, to acknowledge about performing meta-analyses in probiotics is that there's great power to them, but there's also a number of pitfalls. So um, the great power of doing a meta-analysis of probiotics is that some of the trials of probiotics are extremely small. Many of them are, are below 50 people in size. And so with a heterogeneous disorder like IBS, it's very, very difficult to make any um, strong conclusions from small trials. So the great thing about a meta-analysis is it provides statistical power so that you can detect the direction, the size, and the consistency of the effect. It also by performing a meta-analysis allows you to be able to do subgroup analysis of only the highest quality trials. So I'm really a supporter of doing meta-analyses of probiotics. However, there are some problems that we must be aware of. And that's because of the heterogeneous design of, of some of the probiotic trials. So um, some of them deliver probiotics in different ways. Some of them give different doses. Some of them give them for different durations, some for four weeks, some for six months, and some compare them with different placebos. And some of them work in IBSD, some of them work in IBSC, and some of them work in mixed populations. And not only that, but different probiotics inevitably have different microbiological characteristics. So, um, for example, um, you wouldn't do a meta-analysis of drugs in IBS where you combined the effect of different types of drugs in IBS. So therefore, why would you do a meta-analysis that combines different types of probiotics? And therefore, doing a meta-analysis does make it quite difficult to apply to practice because there's a tendency for us um, to recommend that probiotics work. So I've shown you some of the relative risks of those um, um, randomized controlled trials. So it tends to make us think that probiotics work, whereas the reality is that some probiotics do work, some probiotics don't work, and some are untested. So it's very difficult to apply that in practice. Um, and so what I think we must do if we're doing probiotics, um, uh, meta-analyses of probiotics, we must do subgroup analysis based upon the specific species or strains, just as was done in the um, previous meta-analysis. How do we therefore apply that to clinical practice then? Um, I'm going to show you the British Dietetic Association guidelines who, and they've done a really great job in being able to help us to apply these um, randomized controlled trials um, in practice. And again, um, I've, um, I've tweeted this paper. So if you want to have a look at it, I really recommend you, you do because it will be really, really useful in clinic um, for you. And what the British Dietetic Association did, this is my colleague, Dr. Miranda Loma, who with her colleagues, um, from the British Dietetic Association, they looked at all of the randomized controlled trials and they assessed which, um, which probiotic, 
um, affect, affected which symptom from all of the randomized control trials. So it's a really useful um, tool to be able to use, just keep on you in clinic so that you can look at which particular probiotics work. So have a look at that. Here is an example of the sorts of probiotics that have been tested. Um, these are, for example, these are ones that are available in the United Kingdom. Um, and of course, they may be different to the ones that are available in different countries across Europe. So take a look at that particular document, see which ones are available in your country, and therefore work out which are the practical ones that you should be recommending. Because what I'm certain about is you shouldn't just be recommending take a probiotic, because that probiotic may work, it may not, or it may never have been tested. So um, try to base um, those clinical recommendations based upon um, the randomized controlled trials that have been done. So I've talked a little bit about um, what you should be recommending in practice, but I, it's quite important to consider where people actually get their advice from. And for sure, it absolutely is not doctors and nurses and dietitians. Um, uh, here is a study that I performed with my colleague, Dr. Arini Damidi. Um, this actually is a study in constipation. This is the data from uh, 350 people with constipation and where they got their um, information from to take probiotics. So all of them were taking probiotics for their constipation um, and they were asked where they got their um, advice from. And you can see that um, they get their advice mostly from adverts, from TV adverts, from the magazines, from the internet, or they get from, from just because they see them available in shops. Um, so they see them in their environment or on the internet um, and or their family give them advice. And you can see actually the group with the lowest number of uh, um, who impact them the least are health professionals. And the ones that do are alternative practitioners um, rather than their GP, a dietitian, or a specialist doctor. Um, and so I think as a community of health professionals, we have a great deal of work to do in terms of making sure that um, people with, um, with functional bowel disorders um, are getting accurate and evidence-based advice from um, clinical trials um, of probiotics in functional bowel disorders. So I'm finished with talking about probiotics now, and so I'm going to now move on to prebiotics. And um, to define a prebiotic, they are substrates that are selectively utilized by the host microorganisms and conferring a health benefit. So that and so there's um, not just substrates that are used by the microbiota, it is that they are selectively utilized. This notion that some um, substrates um, can be used by some bacteria, but not the others. The most common type of um, prebiotics available on the market are inulin type fructans and the galactooligosaccharides. And there are some examples there um, on the screen that are, are, are available widely. Here is what um, uh, the two major prebiotics are, the inulin type fructans. Um, there are different versions of those depending upon their chain length and their source. So inulin, which is a, a long chain of, um, of fructose molecules is, is available from chicory. Um, there's also olive, oligofructose um, that is produced from enzymatic hydrolysis. And there are also um, fructooligosaccharides that can be synthesized from sucrose. And they have been shown, and I'll show you data for this, to increase the numbers of bifidobacteria and also of lactobacilli in the gut, as well as impacting short chain fatty acids. And there are also beta galactoolic saccharides um, uh, that um, are, can be produced from lactose, so metabolically produced by bacteria from lactose, and they also have been shown to increase bifidobacteria. And again, I will show you evidence for that in a moment. Um, we've reviewed um, the definitions um, and the functions of different prebiotics in that publication there, if you're interested in reading, reading more about it. So I said that I would talk a little bit about um, prebiotics and whether they impacted the microbiome. Um, and here is a meta-analysis we performed um, a couple of years ago now. And what we did is we looked at, at all of the studies of prebiotics and fibers 
and we investigated um, their impact on the gut microbiota. There are 64 different randomized controlled trials of um, fibers in, uh, and, and its impact on the gut microbiome. And what you can see here is that fiber in general um, uh, impacts the gut microbiota in terms of bifidobacteria quite significantly. So um, a standardized mean difference of 0.64, that's quite a large effect size. Um, and it, but it does definitely show that fiber um, impacts the um, bifidobacteria. So it increases the number of bifidobacteria in the gut. But actually, if you look at subgroup analysis, you find a different impact depending upon the type of fiber. And what you can see is that prebiotic fibers, such as the inulin and the GOS that I've just mentioned, have, um, have a significant effect. Other, what we call candidate prebiotics, also have an effect. So things like polydextrose and resistant starches also have an effect. Um, and all, but whereas the general fibers, um, so these might be things like, um, like uh, wheat bran um, and things like that, they have been shown to have very little impact. So if we're looking at all fibers in general, um, they work, but they really work on impacting the microbiota because they impact on, um, because it's the inulin and the GOS and the polydextrose and resistant starches having an impact rather than just the insoluble uh, non-fermentable fibers. Again, if you're interested in reading more about that publication, um, uh, um, you can look on social media and just and download the paper directly from there. The, uh, the um, studies of fiber were not shown to affect alpha diversity. So similar to probiotics, Prebiotics don't impact on diversity of the gut microbiome, but they do impact on specific genera. So do prebiotics work in terms of managing um, irritable bowel syndrome? Here is, a, um, uh, here is one particular study um, of, the, um, of a GOS, a galacto-oligosaccharide um, in irritable bowel syndrome. And um, what this particular randomized controlled trial did is it randomized 60 different people with IBS to either um, a low-dose low prebiotic, a, a high-dose prebiotic, or just a placebo. And what it did is it always started with the placebo running period to sort of mitigate against the placebo um, effect in IBS. And what you can see is that low dose prebiotic um, uh, improved uh, bloating, um, but it, a high dose prebiotic actually worsened bloating. Um, and so um, there's also something really interesting there around the dose of prebiotic being given. And I'll come back to that in a moment. I would also um, say that um, this was only analyzed per protocol, so it wasn't analyzed intention to treat. And so only 44 people, only those people who were able to complete the trial were analyzed in the final study. So what we've done with my colleague, Dr. Bridget Wilson, we have um, performed a systematic review and meta-analysis of all of the randomized controlled trials of prebiotics in irritable bowel syndrome. And we, um, we identified 11 different randomized controlled trials. Um, and when we meta-analyzed them, overall, we showed no benefit of prebiotics in treating total symptoms. So like studies that it used, for example, the IBS SSS tool to measure symptoms. So um, there were no effective prebiotics on total symptoms no effect of prebiotics on abdominal pain, no effect on bloating, and no effect on flatulence. I would like to point out that all of the direction of, of those were generally favoring the effect of prebiotics, but you can see that none of them were statistically significant. And you can see that from the forest plot, there was also quite a lot of heterogeneity in the, in the different studies that were performed so I definitely think this is an area where more uh, clinical trials are needed. I also talked about dose earlier, and I really do think dose is important. What I've shown here is uh, a subgroup analysis of abdominal pain in the top and flatulence in the bottom, um, but separated for the dose of probiotics. So um, in the green, you can see that um, low doses of prebiotic had a trend towards actually benefiting abdominal pain, whereas high doses of a prebiotic had no effect. 
Um, and in terms of looking at flatulence, low doses um, of prebiotics were actually shown to improve flatulence, um, whereas high doses of a prebiotic were shown to a trend, not statistically significant, but you can almost see it is um, a trend towards worsening flatulence. So I think with prebiotics, there is definitely something about the dose being given. Um, so if you want to read a little bit more about that paper, just um, uh, go and read. It's, um, it, it will summarise all of the different analyses we did overall and by dose and type of prebiotic. And one of the reasons why I think dose is really important leads quite nicely into the story about FODMAPs, about fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. I know that many of you will have heard a great deal about FODMAPs and in um, the rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the low FODMAP diet and its use in managing irritable bowel syndrome. So just so that everyone's clear, um, oligosaccharides are fructans and galacto-oligosaccharides, exactly like the um, um, uh, prebiotics I've just been talking about. Um, disaccharides are lactose, Monosaccharides in, uh, refer to fructose, and the polyols um, include sorbitol and mm -hmm. anitol. And here are the mechanisms of how these impact the gut in, um, in everybody, not just in people with IBS. So in the small intestine, the polyols and fructose result in an increase in water in the small intestinal lumen. And this has been shown through um, studies of um, using um, MRI to measure the amount of water after ingestion of polyols and fructose. What's really interesting about fructose is, of course, fructose is usually absorbed quite, quite normally through the GLUT5 transporter in the gut. Um, um, but actually that can saturate very, very quickly. Um, and so um, if we take a really large dose of fructose, um, so for example, um, if we take a lot of apple juice or something, um, then we can overwhelm it and, um, and we can get too much fructose such that it produces a lot of water in the small intestine. But actually if we have fructose alongside glucose, um, then fructose can also be absorbed um, through um, co-transport across GLUT2 in the small intestine. Um, and so that's why um, some fructose is allowed in the diet as long as it's consumed in conjunction with glucose. Then when these um, other carbohydrates arrive in the colon, um, they, uh, they're fermented and they produce gases, hydrogen gas, methane gas, carbon dioxide gas in the colon. And what happens is that causes luminal distension. So it causes the expansion of the colon because there's ex extra gas in there. And that's exactly what I showed at the beginning of this lecture when I showed an increase in the, um, in the production, in the, in the increase in gas volume. And what I explained then is that um, that happens in absolutely um, everybody, um, but it doesn't uh, cause a, um, but it doesn't cause pain unless you have irritable bowel syndrome. So what exactly is the low FODMAP diet? So what this figure shows here on, in the blue line at the top, you can see the um, intake of FODMAPs and on the red line, you can see gut symptoms. And so when in somebody with irritable bowel syndrome who is sensitive to FODMAP intake, where their FODMAP intake is high and it's above that tolerance threshold, so you can see the tolerance threshold there, um, you can see that their symptoms will also be high. So what happens on a low FODMAP diet is that they're given intensive dietary counseling from a dietitian and um, they follow severe restriction of the low FODMAP, of, of FODMAP. So you can see that the, the blue line becomes very, very low. They, they eat, consume a very small amount of FODMAPs and their symptoms, as you can see in the red line, also reduce. And so they feel a lot better. 
But it's really crucial that you don't then stop there and that people don't stay on this diet forever. And I think it, an important point to make here is that most of the clinical trials of the low FODMAP diet measure this period only. They, they usually end after four weeks or six weeks or something of following the FODMAP restriction phase and show that the symptoms improve. But what we're supposed to do after that is then reintroduce um, FODMAP, so um, gradually increase the intake of different FODMAPs and maybe allow them to reintroduce bread, allow them to reintroduce onions, allow them to reintroduce garlic. And you can see that what happens is as they introduce, reintroduce one FODMAP, that they can um, tolerate it. And so now they know they can consume that. Um, and when they introduce another FODMAP, maybe they get symptoms with that. So they now know they can't reintroduce that particular FODMAP. And then after a period of time, they're then able to live the rest of their life on a personalization phase where they can increase their FODMAP intake to their tolerance so that their symptoms are tolerable with a reasonable intake of FODMAPs. And again, if you're interested in reading more about the practical application of the low FODMAP diet, um, I've tweeted a link to this paper that we published there, which is free to access for everybody, it's open access, and you can um, uh, see that figure and the explanation of how that works and how it should be applied in clinical practice. So does the low FODMAP diet work in managing symptoms of IBS? Um, here's the first ever randomized controlled trial of dietary advice of the low FODMAP diet. We performed this back in um, 2012 now um, in 41 people with IBS. We randomized them to either receive low FODMAP dietary advice from a dietitian or to continue their habitual diet. So it wasn't blinded. Um, so because they obviously knew whether they were following a special diet or not. And this is a major problem in dietary trials is how you blind them. Um, because, of course, people people know um, whether they're eating apples or apple juice or whether they're eating bread or whether they're eating onions. And so it's they're very difficult to control for. And I'll talk about how we've managed that in some trials a little later. After four weeks, um, the global symptom question, do you have adequate relief of your symptoms? You can see that people in the control group, um, one quarter had um, adequate relief of symptoms. Um, and in the low FODMAP group, 68% had adequate relief of symptoms. You can also see um, a reduction in the incidence of abdominal bloating and abdominal pain, um, and, the, and a reduction in the severity of abdominal bloating as well. You can also see a reduction in frequency of stools and also an increase in the number of normal consistency stools as well. So uh, a really promising but very preliminary piece of um, research. Um, here's a summary of all of the lots of the other clinical trials of the low FODMAP diet in irritable bowel syndrome. And I highlight this because it's really crucial in dietary trials to look at what you're comparing it to. Are you comparing it to usual diet, as I've just demonstrated in, our, in, in the paper we published in 2012, or are you comparing it to, for example, a typical diet, a high FODMAP diet, or a placebo diet, or are you comparing it to an active intervention? So it makes it very difficult to do um, um, controlled dietary trials. Here's a um, the latest meta-analysis of the low FODMAP diet. This was um, went online early, early, just a couple of months ago. It's not actually been published in an issue of the journal yet. So, um, but do go take a look. It's it's hot off the press. Um, again, if you want a link to this paper, um, it's available on social media. So you can just go and, and take a look at the paper there. There are 12 randomized controlled trials of the low FODMAP diet, comparing them to different, in, um, different controls or active interventions, um, and they, they include 772 patients. In terms of symptom severity, there was a reduction in, in symptom severity that is statistically significant, and the, and the standardized mean difference is actually quite large, showing that the effect um, size of the low FODMAP diet is actually relatively large, compared to, so for example, trials of probiotics, which are statistically significant, but often a very much smaller effect size. If we analyze only the trials that looked at the um, IBS SSS, so as the symptom severity score, um, which is a highly validated um, score of symptoms in IBS, 
Um, the average reduction um, on the low FODMAP diet was uh, a reduction of 50, 45 points. And remember that uh, a reduction of 50 points is considered clinically meaningful. So again, it shows evidence that it has a clinically meaningful reduction in symptoms. And also what was interesting was it increased um, IBS quality of life scores. Um, although it didn't increase it by very much, only by about five um, points on that score, whereas of course 10 is considered a clinically meaningful um, increase in score. So take a look at that. Um, uh, so I think I've demonstrated evidence that it improves the um, clinical uh, symptoms and quality of life in irritable bowel syndrome, but numerous studies, including our first study, but also the study from the Monash University group, have also showed, showed quite profound impacts on the gut microbiota, and in particular to bifidobacteria, which we generally consider a healthy bacteria. So numbers of studies have shown an effect of the low FODMAP diet on the microbiome. So therefore, I'm going to spend the last uh, five minutes of my lecture now just talking about the um, studies which have tried to either use different interventions to the low FODMAP diet or um, added things to the um, low FODMAP diet. And first, therefore, I'm going to compare um, a recent study that compared a low FODMAP diet in people with IBS compared to a prebiotic intervention in IBS. So this was a randomized control trial of 41 people um, with IBS. This was performed by Fernando Asbaros at the, uh, in Barcelona. And um, they compared people following um, taking a prebiotic um, GOS supplement together with a Mediterranean diet to sort of blind them as to whether they were on a special diet or not. And they were compared to people who had a placebo sachet but we're also taking, we're also given low FODMAP dietary advice. So it's effectively comparing a prebiotic with a low FODMAP diet. And what that group showed was that both interventions reduced symptoms. Um, so there was a reduction in flatulence, pain, uh, distension, borborygmy, and bloating in both of the groups. Um, um, but what was interesting is that the symptom improvement continued even after people stopped the prebiotic, whereas they started to return when people stopped the low FODMAP diet. And there was an inevitably a difference in bifidobacteria between the groups because, of course, the prebiotic increases the um, bifidobacteria and the low FODMAP diet decreases the bifidobacteria. So now, rather than comparing interventions, I'm now going to um, present some data on combining interventions. So can you, for example, combine the use of the low FODMAP diet together with a probiotic, for example? And I'm going to talk about a clinical trial we did here that combines the two interventions. This is uh, Dr. Heidi Staudacker, who is my colleague, who we performed this um, randomized control trial published back in 2017 in Gastroenterology Now. Um, and we um, performed that in 104 people with IBS. And so we randomized them to receive low FODMAP dietary advice or placebo sham dietary advice. So this was dietary advice that was just as difficult to follow meant they just had, they had to make so many changes to their diet, they had to cut out so many different foods, but we designed it such that it had absolutely no impact on their FODMAP intake, no impact on their um, fiber intake, no impact on their nutrient intake. So they thought they were following a special diet, but they were just not really following a special diet at all. So it's like, it's the gold standard um, placebo for dietary advice. But it was a two by two factorial randomized control trial. So at the same time as randomizing them to dietary advice for low FODMAPs or not, we also randomized them to a probiotic or a placebo. So we could analyze the effect of the low FODMAP diet or the probiotic. And of course, we were also therefore able to analyze the combined effect of, of, of both of them at the same time. And here's the data. So um, what you can see in terms of adequate symptom relief 
is that if you analysed it intention to treat, there were 57% of people who um, felt they had adequate relief um, after four weeks of the low FODMAP diet compared to only 38% in the sham diet. That was borderline significant, but as you can see, not quite significant when we analysed that per protocol for those who uh, um, uh, complied with the interventions. Um, that um, the differences were statistically significant then. Um, if you have x-ray vision, you may be able to see that there were also um, really quite large redu um, reductions in the IBS SSS total score um, and in the number of days of pain, the pain severity, the satisfaction with bowels, um, and how much it affected their life and resulted in a, in a 117 point reduction in the IBS SSS. Now we've just recently published the microbiological analysis of this. And again, if you're interested to read that paper, there's a link to it there. Um, and what we showed is that um, the low FODMAP diet, exactly as we've shown before, results in a reduction in bifidobacteria. So we sequenced the microbiome after this trial, and we showed that the low FODMAP diet reduced bifidobacteria and some other bacterial groups. Um, and this was even after adjustment for um, multiple testing. So after a, multi a strict um, um, false detection rate detection, we um, still found significant reductions in bifidobacteria. But then when we um, analyzed the four groups, so whether the low FODMAP diet plus a prebiotic had any, any beneficial effect, what we demonstrated was that um, by adding in a probiotic, it increased lactobacilli, increased streptococcus, and did not cause the reduction in bifidobacteria that occurred in the low FODMAP diet. So the take home message from this study is that adding a bifidobacteria containing probiotic in conjunction with the low FODMAP diet will prevent the decline in bifidobacteria that occurs with the low FODMAP diet alone. So if you are thinking of using the low FODMAP diet, do think of recommending a bifidobacteria containing probiotic at the same time. And then finally, just in the last two minutes, I'm now going to present the only um, clinical trial that's ever tried to combine a low FODMAP diet in conjunction with um, a prebiotic. So this is my colleague, Dr. Bridget Wilson, um, and we performed um, this randomized control trial of 69 people with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, we collected all of their dietary data, all of their questionnaire data, um, and highly phenotyped their stool and urine um, for microbiota and metabolomics. Um, and then we randomized them either to the sham dietary advice, to, so pretend dietary advice and a placebo, so that's a control group, or a group um, that were having low FODMAP diet and a placebo, so that's low FODMAP diet, or a group um, with low FODMAP diet plus um, a, a small dose of galacto-oligosaccharides, so this GOS supplement. And then we followed them up for four weeks and measured all the same things at the end point. And what we did was we wanted to compare, the, um, our hypothesis one was to compare symptoms between the control group um, that basically got nothing and compared them to people having both a low FODMAP diet and, and a prebiotic. And our second hypothesis was to see whether um, having the low FODMAP diet and the prebiotic would um, prevent this decline compared to having a low FODMAP diet alone. So this is the um, effect on symptoms um, and what you can see in this is adequate relief. And so what you can see is that people who had the low FODMAP diet and the prebiotic, um, more of them um, had an impro um, improvement in adequate relief. And you can see there were improvements in IBS SSS um, subscores for some of those and improvements in stool frequency as well. So the combination of the low FODMAP diet and this prebiotic improves symptoms significantly compared to control. But in terms of our second hypothesis, at the same time as improving symptoms, did it prevent the decline in bifidobacteria? The figure on the left, um, this is from in situ hybridization so that we can measure the concentration. And you can see that over time, um, the bifidobac um, having a low FODMAP diet with a prebiotic 
still did not prevent the decline. We then sequenced the bacteria and also demonstrated it didn't prevent the decline. We then analyzed the short chain fatty acids and the pH, and we demonstrated that adding the um, prebiotic in didn't prevent the decline in any of those either. So our hypothesis was that the, the low FODMAP diet did reduce the bifidobacteria and short chain fatty acids, but adding a prebiotic did not overcome this effect on bifidobacteria or short chain fatty acids. And if you want to read more about that paper, it was published um, last year in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. So my 45 minutes is now up. Um, and so I will say that in summary, um, the pathogenesis of IBS involves the gut microbiota. Um, there's considerable evidence for the effectiveness of probiotics, um, but we must refer to specific strains. Some studies show prebiotics are effective in IBS symptoms, but overall evidence shows no effect on symptoms and the dose and the type of prebiotic will likely be important. FODMAPs contribute to symptoms in some people with IBS by increasing the luminal water and by increasing colonic gas. Um, and numerous randomized controlled trials show that a low FODMAP diet improves symptoms, but it unfavorably modifies the gut microbiota. And combining the low FODMAP diet with probiotics or prebiotics may improve the effectiveness um, of it, but only a bifidobacteria probiotic will limit the decline in bifidobacteria. I'm out of time, but I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who contributed to the work I've presented today. And so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Whelan, for your uh, presentation and for your insights on the importance of microbiota, diet, and probiotics in the management of patients with uh, IBS. Uh, yeah. I, I found your data on the combination of bifidobacteria and low FODMAP diet intriguing because it seems that uh, you do need FODMAP to select the bifidobacteria and let them survive. But apparently you can overcome this mechanism by supplementation of the bifidobacteria themselves. Uh, how, how can you explain this uh, apparent contradiction? It's such a great question. For me, there is a real contradiction that um, bifidobacteria, which we know that when you supplement them, I'm, I'm afraid we, we lost you, Professor Whelan. Yes, I can confirm that we've lost Professor Whelan. I'm sorry, but it seems to be a problem with his connection at his end. I hope he will be reconnecting soon. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, meanwhile, uh, yes, uh, uh, I I would like to uh, to mention that there have been several questions from the audience, and I would like to thank. In particular, Professor Aziz for his active interaction with the audience. Uh, I had selected a few questions for, for Professor Whelan, and uh, I hope he will be available again soon, especially because I have always been <laughs> concerned I always had some concern with restrictive diets, especially in the long term. And, uh, and uh, well, uh, I would like to hear the opinion of, of Professor Whelan, especially on the possible effects on the long term of these uh, low food diets, because he clearly showed that uh, the patients can be re-educated to assume FODMAPs uh, progressively. But we know that uh, there are several patients who stick to this kind of diet for a, for a long time. And uh, we, I am personally concerned 
about the possible negative effects. Oh, you are back, Professor Wiener. Okay, we are all very happy to see to see you back. <laughs> not not as happy as I not as happy as I am. I'm afraid <laughs> that we've had really really bad weather, and anyone listening in from the UK will say that um, we're having storms in the UK, and I think it's affected my oh, Wi-Fi connection. Um, so I was saying that um, we know. So I've tried to. Um, combat this decline by using probiotics and um, and we have shown it to be effective whereas I think giving a small amount of a prebiotic when you are dramatically reducing the amount of prebiotic in the background diet isn't enough um, and so I don't think um, that can work. What we are working on at the moment is trying to see what happens to the microbiota, not at four weeks, but after a year of reintroduction and personalization, when people have reintroduced lots of prebiotic containing foods back in, because what I suspect happens is that the, the microbiota do bounce back. And we're currently working on data to suggest that at the moment, but it just emphasizes the importance of not following the restriction phase for, for too long. It's, it's really a top-down approach to get people um, into symptom remission and then to see which foods they're sensitive to. Okay, thank you. Then we have also learned that you must have some special powers because you have just answered my second question, which I was explaining why you were disconnected. So some, somehow, somehow you, <laughs> you got my, my question. There have been also some questions from the audience. I would like to, to propose to you, for instance, uh, is there a, a, any other kind of diet you would uh, uh, suggest besides low FODMAP? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the easy answer is that um, people um, back in the 70s and 80s did lots of work on fibres, and I broadly speaking, I, I don't think there's strong evidence that fibre um, works. We are now revisiting that and we are looking at different combinations of fibres to look at fibre supplementation. And so really to date, the most effective evidence of fibre is isfagula, psyllium, um, um, but outside of that, there's not much evidence. And so we're currently working on ways to combine different fibres to see if they're effective. Um, and in terms of other diets, I think the reality is there are very few studies that have been done. So people have tried, for example, to, um, for example, people have investigated the ketogenic diet. So um, where you cut out, um, you know, lots of carbohydrates and focus on proteins. And the problem is, is that, of course, that will work because you what you're doing, uh, you're cutting out carbohydrates and therefore you're cutting out your gut fermentation. But I would be more concerned about following something like a keto diet for life, where you're not providing yourself with um, high levels of fermentable carbohydrates. Um, and so um, it's around understanding the mechanisms of diets. And often you can have three different diets and people, set, people swear that one works compared to the other. But often they might be working through the same mechanism because a keto diet, I think, probably works because you're reducing fermentable um, carbohydrates. Thank you. Well, you know that we Italians are never nationalist except for soccer and for food. So my next question is, what's your opinion about the Mediterranean diet? So I, um, so I, I think the Italians are like the British. We also like um, football and food. Um, and so we, um, I, I um, completely agree that the Mediterranean diet has a whole host of, of benef beneficial effects um, out, out with IBS. And so we know that it's related with increased, um, uh, you know, increased lifespan, reduced mortality, reduced cardiovascular disease. So should everyone in the world be following a Mediterranean diet? Absolutely categorically. Does it have an effect on IBS? We don't know that. Um, because of the high content of the Mediterranean diet in terms of different um, fruits and vegetables, 
I suspect there's every chance that some of them might cause symptoms and some of them won't. But what we know is that the Mediterranean diet um, increases the diversity of the microbiome. And I think that has to be a good thing for our overall gut, gut health. So if people can follow a low FODMAP um, and um, uh, Mediterranean diet, then, then that's great. And so those countries, Italy and Spain, where they have lots of people following a Mediterranean diet, um, I, I, I think that's um, the challenge to be able to combine the two. And of course, the other um, thing that the Mediterranean diet has is high monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats as well. And there is some work around the role of those, particularly as inflammatory mediators. So some of the immune responses, um, I would say that the evidence of that in IBS is, is fairly limited at that stage though. So okay. yes, we should all be following a Mediterranean diet. Yep. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is your webinar manager speaking. Um, we're running out of time, so we need to uh, move on to the video and then we'll have the reminder of the next date of this uh, meeting and uh, we'll have time for uh, some Q&A after that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wieland again. Thank you. Bromatech welcomes all participants to this international event entitled Microbiota and Gut-Brain Connection, a new frontier in neurogastroenterology organized in partnership with the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility. It is a pleasure and honor for Bromatech to sponsor this important and unique scientific forum. Bromatech is a biotech company that conducts research into the properties of bacteria since 1985. At the forefront of development for probiotics for human use, Bromatech is now an established company with a clear product offering for the natural treatment of the digestive system. The bacteria in the microbiome help digest our food, regulate our immune system, influence our behavior and protect against other bacteria that cause disease. The strain specificity and efficacy of its probiotic products differentiate Bromatech from other companies. Mastering the natural attributes of nature for a harmonious life is Bromatech's inner motivation. Nature can teach us much more than we presently know. Microbes inhabit just about every part of the human body. We humans are mostly microbes. Over 100 trillion of them live in our body. Microbes outnumber our human cells by 10 to 1. The majority live in our gut, particularly in the large intestine. Over the years, Bromatech has built a research team that constantly analyzes the use and properties of bacteria that form part of the microbiome. Advances in genome sequencing technologies and metagenomic analysis, that is, the genetic study of genomes taken directly from environmental samples, have enabled scientists to study these microbes and their function, and to research microbiome-host interactions, both in health and disease. Partnerships with universities and other research centers provide a valuable source of inputs as knowledge transfer between academia and industry is an important driver of innovation. By means of laboratory testing and relentless gathering of clinical data, the company continually develops its own formulations. Scientific works and medical literature support our products. The human microbiome has extensive functions such as development of immunity, defense against pathogens, host nutrition including production of short-chain fatty acids important in host energy metabolism, synthesis of vitamins and fat storage as well as an influence on human behavior, making it an essential organ of the body without which we would not function correctly. Bromatech has a long experience in microbiota research that allows it to understand the interrelation of different bacterial strains and dose the right quantity for optimal results. This is done through a well-developed methodology that combines laboratory research, clinical trials and modern production solutions. Bromatech is committed to education. Over the years, it has regularly offered to the healthcare professional community multiple educational programs on the properties of bacteria and their interrelation with human health. 
To promote advancements in the understanding of the microbiome, it has founded congresses, seminars, academic courses and scholarships. The microbiome is dynamic and changes with early development, environmental factors such as diet and the use of antibiotics, and in response to disease. The complexity and plasticity of the microbiota is important in maintaining homeostasis with the host's immune system and has an important impact on the digestive system. Speakers from different fields have had the opportunity to address participants sharing their clinical experience on the use of probiotics or presenting scientific research. An open debate is always welcomed at the end of each presentation and participants stimulate discussions with their questions. Bromatech educational programs introduce medical professionals to the comprehension of this fascinating area of biology. Thank you for your attention and participation. So before, welcome back, uh, before closing this session, I would like uh, to remind you the next uh, event of this uh, webinar course uh, on microbiota and gut brain connection. This event will be chaired by Professor Giovanni Barbara and will include a lecture by Professor Stephen Collins on microbiota brain axis in IBS, and a lecture from, by Professor Alessio Fasano on gut microbiota and celiac disease. So it looks like another very exciting session of this course, and I hope that all of you will be able to participate. Uh, I would now like to thank uh, again Professor Barbara, the speakers and all participants and Bromatech for the organization of this webinar in collaboration with the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility. And I wish you a very good night. Sleep well. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions if there are any pending okay maybe about the uh, relationship between microbiota and the sleep at this time it's uh, this is <laughs> an unexpected opportunity <laughs> but maybe you do have some data in this respect do you <clears throat> Um, so I, I will let um, Professor Aziz speak um, on behalf of himself. Um, I don't have any data on um, the gut microbiota and sleep. I think one of the challenges of um, e exploring sleep as a phenomenon is that it's associated with so many confounders. So, for example, we know that people who sleep poorly eat more sugar and have a worse diet. And we know that if you uh, make people sleep better, that we that they uh, uh, that um, that their sugar intake goes down, and so and we all know what it's like when we haven't slept well, and we the next day we're grumpy and maybe we eat a, a little worse. So the relationship is very difficult to investigate, um, and diet is just one confounder. I'm sure stress and anxiety drive both. Uh, a, a, a poor microbiota and poor sleep. And so it's just very difficult to investigate. I don't know of any clinical trials that have tried to intervene on that. Um, Kazim, are you aware of any? Uh, not really, not the link between gut microbiota and sleep um, as such, particularly in IBS. So what I do know is that my five-year-old daughter's woken up uh, and you know, nothing is going to <laughs> work now, given that she's up. But nevertheless, there is an association between pain and sleep. Chronic pain is often associated with poor sleep, and it is evidence that poor sleep is associated with more pain, including an irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, thank you very much also for these uh, additional explanations and uh, now I think uh, since we have learned that uh, sleep is important and sleeping enough is important, I think uh, our organizer will uh, let us, all of us, go to our deserved 
rest. And thank you again, in particular, to Professor Aziz and Professor Whelan for their very kind contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.